Hello everyone. Welcome to this time of worship together as we celebrate the festival of Pentecost when we remember how the Spirit came as in tongues of fire among those disciples gathered together 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Come, Holy Spirit, and help us confess our sins and shortcomings to God through you. Come, Holy Spirit, and help us know afresh in our lives the gift of forgiveness that you offer to us. Come, Holy Spirit, and help us and guide us as we seek to praise you today. Come, Holy Spirit, unite us with one another and with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I will be reading today from Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1 in the Shetland dialect, translated by Charles Gregg. The folk that had been with Jesus were all fair and wondering what was going to happen next. They were all biding together, but didn't think what to, to do or what to look in. One day, one day, as they sat about, there was an awful dunder in the loft that they didn't think what to make of. Then there was a gale of wind that came in the boot and filled the house. There then came blinks of fire that lashed it on every aim. They could do it and the ass started to speak in a strange kind of way, so that the friends can't what they were saying. A lock of fox stood about wondering what was going on. Some of them thought that the men were just being over friendly with the wine. But Peter pat them straight. We're no being drunken, he said. This is what the old prophet said would one day happen. One day the Lord will pour out his spirit on Aberdeen. Young boys and lasses, I'll give you my message. Young men will understand who things should be. Old men will fold their imagination and see what would make life perfect. Men and women will preach for me and tell you what's in my heart. You'll see things the lick of what you've never seen afore. Things that you couldn't even dream about. The sun will gain black and the moon gain red. And then you'll think that the day of the Lord has come. A day will make you wimmer and wonder. Whatever seeks the Lord that day will be saved. This was the start of something wonderful and new. A time when things happen that you could hardly believe. Them that had work, work close at day, and they shared everything. They made sure that everybody had what they needed. Every day they were to be fun at the kirk. Every day they had their meat together. And every day they praised the Lord. Amen. Hi, I'm Rachel and I've been asked to do my testimony. Um, this is Emma, who is five weeks old. She's the newest member of our congregation. So I'll add a photo on the end so that you can see her face. Uh, I became a Christian at a very young age. I was brought up in a Christian home. And at about the age of four or five, I prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into my heart. It was a very simple belief. Um, I knew that Jesus was real and that he listened to me. And I wanted to be part of his family. When I was about 12, I had a kind of cementing of my faith when my sister Ali went to an Alpha course and she relayed to me some of the historical and archaeological facts that she was hearing and the things they were discussing. And it helped me to know that it wasn't just a childlike thing to believe in, that I could trust in this as an adult as well. Going on from there, I carried on and had a, I had a gap year from school when I was 18. And I had read a book called The Jungle Pilot about Nate Saint and Jim Elliot going to Ecuador and trying to reach a tribe who had never been reached before with the gospel. It was a really inspiring 
book and it was what led me to go to Brazil for four months in my gap year and we saw amazing things we met people who were just positive and had faith in the face of having nothing we built buildings for churches and saw prayers answered but also we as a team prayed together and um, read the bible together every day for four months day in day out and that just led to me having a spiritual growth and an experience of Jesus I'd never had before because it's quite intense and I think hard not to grow spiritually when you spend that time daily exploring the bible and prayer with other people uh, since then I came home I went back to university I came back to Shetland and started teaching met Lee uh, who I married and we went for a year away and then came back we're now here and in Shetland we have three children and this is where we're at just now so I thought I would say a little bit about 2020 and how it's been going and what Jesus is talking to me about at the moment. So this year I began by reading a book called 10,000 Reasons by Matt Redman about his song that he wrote. And it's about how people have been singing this song in all sorts of circumstances in very dark times, in their hardest times, they've chosen to sing this song, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. And it made me think about how we can choose to praise God even when things are really really tough and then I read a book about somebody who became paraplegic after an accident and had no use for his body from the neck down and again his gratitude and positivity in the face of that just was remarkable and got me thinking and then there was a bible study where we read John chapter 8 verse 12 where Jesus says I am the light of the world whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but has the light of life and again I just thought right God is God is the light in this darkness there is a reason that people can praise when things are dark because Jesus is light and he has brings us real hope when things are tough then we were just away and we were in Aberdeen in lockdown having to wait for Emma to come and uh, you know as we were there I was reading Corrie ten Boom's book The Hiding Place where she talks about her experience in World War II and concentration camps and again just this incredible testimony of people hearing about Jesus and having hope and having joy even in the worst of places they were ministering to people in these bunkers where they had lice and they were being worked to the bones and you know worked to death and they were able to praise God sing his praises have prayer meetings and see real joy come to people who were in the worst of places so this is where I'm at at the moment. God is just teaching me um, and hopefully it's a helpful message for you too. For some reason God is teaching me that I can choose to praise him even when things are difficult. That I can remember he is the light of life, that he brings light to the darkness. That as I look to him I will know that there is goodness, that there is light, that there is hope and that there is something bigger than the situation we're in just now. So while I'm at home in lockdown, I've got a newborn, some days my energy is low, some days it can be quite hard to have toddlers and no support. Um, but I am, I am given a bit of hope that I can choose to look at Jesus, I can praise him and I know that he gives me light and hope and strength for my day. We're going to hear another reading now, this time from the Book of Numbers. I don't know what, if anything, comes to mind when I mention the Book of Numbers. But this is a cartoon that came my way a few years ago, and rather well sums up the whole of the book. We're going to hear from chapter 11, which starts out, as that cartoon suggests, with some complaints and some of the people having a bit of a moan. And what we're going to hear is part of the response that God gives to them. A reading from Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 to 30. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad 
and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among the registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Amen. I wonder if you've come across in magazines or on the internet those sort of personality quizzes where you get a set of seemingly unrelated questions where, based on what your responses are, you're told something about who you are. I came across one recently with such questions as, would you rather fight a goose or a shark? Would you rather sleep for three hours every time you fell asleep or for 24 hours? Would you rather never eat pizza again? or eat pizza for every meal you have from now on. Substitute in whatever meal you like if you're not fond of pizza. But that last question there about having a food you really enjoy in an overabundance or having to give it up completely has some resonances with this passage from Numbers. God has responded to something by pouring out the Spirit on those people. But what's that a response to? The people are journeying away from Egypt, away from slavery. But they're starting to misremember just how things were. Some of the people are starting to say, oh, back in Egypt, we had all this wonderful food, such a variety of things to eat. And now we have to eat manna every single meal. God has provided for the people in the desert where there's not a whole lot of food to go around, enough food every day for them. It resembles coriander seed, it can be baked into cakes, and it tastes like rich cream. provides all the nutrients and nourishment that the people need. But it's the same thing for every meal. And so this gracious gift of manna is no longer being seen as something wonderful and amazing, but it's starting to be taken for granted that in the desert it just would be there. The novelty of it has gone. It's boring. And having this ample food in the desert is no longer a cause to inspire wonder and joy in the way that it once did. Some of the people are showing that they're no longer supportive of Moses as leader. They're no longer uh, in awe and wonder and praise of God for helping them in this way. But they're complaining. God's not thrilled with the complaints and Moses isn't all that happy seeming to be left on his own to deal with these people who have unrealistically high expectations of him. So he calls out to God for help, and God tells him, Okay, gather together seventy of the elders, and I will come down amongst you, I will talk to you, and I will share the spirit on them that I have put on you, Moses. Oh, and uh, the final touch in a way that doesn't strike me as the most level heavy response to the initial complaint. I'll give those people who wanted meat some meat, not just for one day, not for two days, not for five days, not for 20 days, but for a whole month until you've got meat coming out of your nostrils. Because you've rejected your God through all your whining, saying, oh, why did we ever leave Egypt? God's response Give those uh, people who wanted meat more than they know what to do with. And to share the spirit with the other leaders is perhaps a slightly strange response to that initial complaint, given what the trigger was. Because the one thing doesn't necessarily flow on from the other. All the people saying, oh, we're all fed up having the same food every day. And part of that response then is to say, okay, we'll gather 70 people together and I'll share the spirit on 72 people who in that moment will all have the appearance of prophets. Something similar happens at Pentecost. The disciples aren't complaining as such, but through what they say, we recognise things aren't quite how they expected them to be. And they're calling for something different. Ten days earlier than Pentecost, the disciples have been calling on Jesus to take things back to how they used to be, to restore the kingdom and wage a physical battle against the Roman Empire. 
with Jesus as the military commander. And again, to that uh, impetus and trigger, the response is to pour out the Spirit. To show power not in a military or governmental way, but power in a dynamic and spiritual way. You may have heard the talk before about uh, the youth pastor speaking to the children he's got gathered before him uh, and says, OK, I want you to put your hand up as soon as you know what I'm talking about. And all the kids go, oh, yeah, OK. Uh, and he says, OK, the thing I'm thinking of is uh, it lives in trees. No one puts their hand up. Uh, it collects and eats nuts. No one puts their hand up. Uh, OK, uh, it's grey. Oh, there might be, you might see a red one. No hands going up at all. It's got a long bushy tail, no hands, it jumps from branch to branch in the tree, and no one puts a hand up. As this is a long, awkward pause, and then a small hand goes up, very excited, the youth passed the point, so he says, yes, yes, what is it? It's like, well, I mean, I know the answer's got to be Jesus, because the answer's always Jesus in these things you ask us. It sure sounds like a squirrel to me. In these passages we've had, uh, the answer is slightly different, but the answer seems to always be, whatever the topic, the Holy Spirit. We don't have enough food, you need the Holy Spirit. We want you to restore the kingdom, you need the Holy Spirit. That seems to be what the answer is. At this stage in the Exodus journey, the people have been getting used to a very different way of life. These are people born into slavery in Egypt. Their whole life has run according to one pattern. And now it's a completely different arrangement. It's not easy to change the habits of a lifetime. And some of them have got to the stage where this new life pattern has a monotony in journeying in this way that's starting to get to them. And they're getting angsty. And they're not remembering very well just what the monotony was like before, because they'd got into a pattern before this. Escaping Egypt and entering the desert was never going to be an easy thing to do. And they started that journey full well of what some of the difficulties would be. But those difficulties were balanced with the excitement and anticipation of freedom and this new thing that they'd been longing for. But now, as that journey's gone on, these challenges and the difficulties are present in a much more focused and forceful way. And for some of the people, they're starting to take over. Some people in Britain, perhaps you, perhaps some people you know, are getting to that sort of stage with our current situation. This lockdown began with difficulties. People were well aware of what some of those would be. Some people may have balanced that with an element of excitement and curiosity about what this new unknown way of doing things would be like. But I think for a lot of people, uh, those challenges and difficulties were balanced with an acceptance of the need and necessi necessity for them, uh, and that there was an ultimate good behind them. But as time goes on, some of those difficulties have made their presence known more forcefully in some people's lives. And uh, this many weeks in, that balance is starting to shift. And like Moses, that some of those in leadership are starting to experience more challenge and sometimes aggression, where there was previously a more forgiving attitude to responding to this new thing. So perhaps then, some of you can relate to the way some of those in the Exodus group are finding the monotony of journeying across the desert with the same manner to eat every day, and how that might be starting to get to them. Because this is affecting their self-esteem, it's affecting their family relationships, their relationship to Moses, their relationship to God. It's put across about being a question of what the food is that they're eating. But that might not be the underlying issue. There might be a bit more to it than that. That might not be the question to which the answer is the Holy Spirit. That might just be uh, a snapshot into what that is. Because the answer that we're given to whatever problems they're facing are, well, you need the Holy Spirit. Moses is an individual leader here, and he's dealing with some things which are starting to overwhelm him. And we might have thought that God's response to that would be to strengthen him, to make him an even more brilliant leader, to give him all the gifts and skills that he needs, to give him the words of wisdom 
uh, to speak uh, and gather everyone enthusiastically behind this journey. Maybe to pour the spirit out in bucket loads on him. But actually the response of God is to share that with other leaders around him. To give other people the drive that they need. Who can then see things from Moses' perspective as they share in that leadership with him. The Holy Spirit there then gets to the root of the problems. The Spirit helps those people see their situations afresh. Because the solutions the people had been proposing weren't going to work because they hadn't identified what the issue was that they were facing. Moses was struggling with his calling. The disciples of Jesus at the time of the first Pentecost were struggling to see what the kingdom of God was supposed to be like, how it would look. So God's Spirit works through them to affect them and those nearby to them to help them see the truth more clearly. Moses gathers 70 of the leaders around him, but 72 experience the sharing of the Spirit. Joshua is sceptical of what's going on with these extra two, and Moses has to seek to enable him to come round to perceiving the wonder of this moment rather than thinking that those two might be challenging Moses to want to take over themselves. This is a shadow of Pentecost, when the disciples experience the sharing of the Spirit, and some who witness that are sceptical, and Peter has to seek to enable them to come round to perceive the wonder of the prophetic hopes coming alive, by likewise noting the promise for the Spirit to inspire far more people than would have been expected. Slaves, free. Men, women, young, old, I will pour my spirit out on all flesh, those inside the tent and those outside the tent. Peter quotes the prophet Joel, but this is a longing that goes back much further, all the way back to Moses' desperate cry, oh, that all God's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. This when there was a tradition that claimed there could only be one prophet at a time that suddenly loads of people are experiencing that move of the Spirit in their lives and coming out. Some of the people around Moses express their frustration through boredom with the gracious gift of God, taking for granted the manner that provided all physical nourishment and strength in the desert. It's worth noting that we might find ourselves tempted into something similar as we celebrate Pentecost today. Are we at risk of boredom with the gracious gift of God? taking the spirit for granted, which provides all spiritual nourishment and strength in whatever deserts we may find ourselves in. God's answer to these questions and topics seems to be experience the spirit afresh. We might be like some of those people traveling in the Exodus, uh, experiencing the gift of God as spirit as they experienced manna. But then we might have those questions for ourselves, this Pentecost. Is this new pace of life starting to get to you? Pray for the Holy Spirit to give you strength and guidance. Do you take God for granted or is that starting to happen? Well, have the Holy Spirit afresh. Has the grace of God, like the manna, become unexciting? Have the Holy Spirit afresh. Is the leadership position you find yourself in difficult? Uh, and overwhelming. Have the Holy Spirit afresh. Is there someone who's supposed to be a leader in the situation you're in? Or is there someone you know who's a leader, who's exhausted and lacking vision and lacking the drive as Moses did? Well, then still have the Spirit afresh as God shares that with you, that you might share with them and uh, create that communal leadership together. And if you're outside the main tent, well, perhaps you might get it as well, because it's not confined to just that small section of people. I did that quiz, that one I told you about, about the geese and the shark and the sleeping and the pizza. And at the end, what it revealed about me was, you put the happiness of others above your own. You're always worried about making other people happy, but sometimes that can backfire. You know what, I don't think that's the most thorough description of me I've ever read, but I didn't really expect it to be. It's not the right questions to do that. I'm not sure what the right questions are, 
But I think this Pentecost, I know what the answer is. I think I could probably do with a bit more Holy Spirit guidance. And perhaps you could too. Loving God, we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit to help us as we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and direct the rulers of the world with your wisdom. Fill our leaders with the talents they need and the discernment necessary to seek the common good. Spirit of God, show us all how to bring peace and justice and unity to the nations. Holy Spirit, fill our homes. Set our hearts on fire with the warmth of your love. Inspire us all to new beginnings. Holy Spirit, we come to you for those who are eaten up with guilt and anxiety. We bring to you the despairing and despondent, those who are uncertain how to use their time or money, and any who are tempted to do wrong. May they have your guidance and strength. We pray for all who are weak, those who are ill, those who are struggling to cope on their own, but might find themselves needing to. Those known to us in particular need or trouble who ask for our prayers. And Holy Spirit, we pray for those who are grieving, holding before you in thankfulness the memories of those who have died. Christ is the light of the world a light which no darkness can quench. Draw near to those who are struggling with grief today. Holy Spirit, may we look for and know your presence in our daily lives, in our times of pain and our times of joy, in our times of worship and praise and in our laments. Create a new life in each of us. Renew and refresh us and hold us close to you. We conclude these prayers by sharing in the words Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. sharing in this time of worship today and thanks especially to all of you who have helped take part in the service. As we go, may the spirit of truth lead you into all truth, give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and the strength to proclaim the word and works of God. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit 
be with you and those whom you hold dear this day and forevermore. Amen.